welcome back. This is Angela at beginninggenealogist.com. How are you doing? Today, I want to talk about telling the story. How do you put the meat on the bone, so to speak, when you are documenting your family history. You've started to collect the documents, you've gotten birth certificates, and you've gotten death certificates, and marriage records, and you've started to go to the archives, and you're so excited because you've gotten those census records that are now beginning to reflect what was happening in 1930, and 1920, and 1910. Well, you might be excited but you might be disappointed to find out that some of your family members aren't quite as enthusiastic as you are. So how do you get them interested? Well, the suggestion is to tell the story. And the question sometimes is, well, I have these documents that are interesting to me. And of course, we love to look at death records, and we love to look at census records. And as you look at them more and more, you get accustomed to more and more data that you can extract. But to the rest of the family, how do you tell the story and make it interesting? Well, one of the rules of genealogy is to always place your family in the proper historical context. So in other words, if you're showing a document that's from the 19th century, the mid-19th century, where the chances are in some kind of way your family could have been impacted by what was happening around it. Was your family part of a westward migration? That's a part of history. And that's a story that needs to be told because maybe your family was part of that migration. West. Was your family impacted by the Civil War? That's very, very important. And most families were impacted in some way by things that were going on in the Civil War. Let's move to the 20th century. What happened to your family during the Depression? How were they making their living? Is the lifestyle that you start to notice some changes or some surprises. Maybe you didn't know an ancestor had a business in 1920, but certainly in 1930, you see that they no longer had a business. Is it possible that the Depression could have had a tremendous effect on their lives? Was your family possibly part of the migration or the great migration, where many African families, African American families, left the Deep South and suddenly move to northern cities, Chicago, Detroit, New York, certainly uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. These were destination cities were for so many families. Is that part of your family story? If it is, then incorporate that. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, it's going to be very important that you start to read about that period. If you notice, for example, your family is documented in, let's say, New York, but they had Mississippi roots. And 1900, you see them in Mississippi, 1910, they're in Mississippi. But by the 1930s or 1940s, your family is now living in New York. There's a story there and the story of that migration. Now, how do you find out what other kinds of things happened? Well, this is where you start to follow one of those rules about becoming acquainted with the local history, the history of the region where your ancestors lived. If your ancestors came from a certain community in the South and perhaps the major crop where your ancestor lived was tobacco. Well, it's going to be very important to look and to read books about the industry and what it was like for individuals who worked on tobacco farms. Or did your ancestors live perhaps in a situation farther south where they may have lived as sharecroppers? Well, then it's going to be very important for you to start to read about what lives were like for sharecroppers. And particularly if your ancestors left and moved some other place, whether they went west out to California or whether they went northward to Chicago, Detroit, or to Flint, or to Gary, or to other places, there's the story 
to tell. I remember uh, an interesting call that I had gotten. This has been about four or five years ago. A gentleman called me who had lived a good portion of his life in the Midwest in Kansas City. And he was very surprised because on one of my websites, he saw the name of an ancestor. This was his grandfather. This gentleman was in his 60s. And his grandfather had lived until the mid to late 1940s. And he was born in the 30s. And so he remembered his grandfather to an extent. His grandfather, as the family had pretty much resigned itself, was prone to exaggeration. And his grandfather had told stories about how he had lived in Indian territory. And I'm talking about, in this particular case, a man uh, or a family, an African-American family. And he had lived in the West, and he was a marshal, and he used to arrest people if they were breaking the law. And it didn't matter what their background was, whether they were black, Indian, white, he could arrest them and take them to jail. Well. This was now in the Midwest, in Missouri, and most people in the family would kind of say, you know, Grandpa's been telling this, this story for many, many years. He's prone to exaggeration and, you know, just kind of ignore it. He was surprised. He was on the Internet. He came to my website, and he saw his grandfather's name as one of the black U.S. deputy marshals who worked for Judge Parker's court. This was something that he had not known, but he realized he had heard his grandfather tell those stories. But others in the family, perhaps because the, the tragic reality of the day was that that was not the situation at that time in the 1930s and 40s in, in Missouri and Kansas City in particular. And Grandpa died and went to his grave with his hundreds of stories with him. And then later, this man was almost in his tears that these stories were dismissed as not being true. Thankfully, at least, he found some information and I was able to share it with him. That yes, your ancestor was quite a well-known man back in the day. Certainly by the turn of the century, he had a grown daughter who had moved and moved to Kansas City. And he had gone and lived in Kansas City, uh, lived for another several decades, in fact. Uh, and lived with a family, but he often spoke about his days in the 1880s when he used to arrest people in Indian Territory. The point is that the stories are there. Sometimes you will have to learn more about those stories by learning the history yourself. Unfortunately, in that example I was able to share, this individual had the stories. He was giving away freely to the family, but the family didn't necessarily believe that they were true. You want to put the meat on the bones. You want to be able to extract the stories. Learn a little bit more about the history, and you will learn a little bit more about your family. I've said many times, genealogy cannot be practiced in a vacuum how true that is. You must incorporate history, you must incorporate geography, to an extent cartography in terms of really becoming acquainted with, with map reading certainly. But there's so many other disciplines from which you're going to be able to get information that will really help you to enrich the story about your family. You have to do a little bit of homework. It's not easy, but it's so much fun. Anyway, that's it for today. Remember to keep doing what you do, of course, but incorporate those other disciplines. Learn that history, and that meat on the bone is going to really, 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 really develop. Good luck as you tell your story. I'm looking forward to seeing some of your stories in the very near future. Take care. Bye-bye. See you next time.